Hello and welcome to the Wide Angle Show. My name is Barney Carolan. I'm Nick Carroll. My name is Greg Manahan. And my name is Michael O'Sullivan. Between all four of us, we have over 90 years of experience in video and photography. On the show today, we have a great lineup of guests. We have Mark Griffin, the award-winning wedding photographer, who is going to be sharing his experiences and top tips on how to become a professional photographer. I caught up with one of the best landscape photographers in the world, Dave Naughton, at the Canon event in Glendalough, and shot a short video of his 10 top tips on how to photograph landscapes. Greg Manahan will be interviewing Stephen O'Reilly, renowned director of photography, on the best way to make high-quality film on a budget. Michael O'Sullivan will be comparing the Canon 5D Mark IV and the Canon 5D SOR. Greg will be talking to you shortly about the new Canon EOS C200. One of our sponsors of the show, Mike and Bob Kahn from Kahn's Cameras, will be coming in to do a quick review on the Canon 6D Mark II. But before this, Mike will be chatting to Greg and Nick about their up and coming celebrations. Now to Michael O'Sullivan, who spent the morning talking to Mark Griffin, the award winning wedding photographer. Good man, that's great. Look at each other, guys. Perfect, guys. Bring the brolly slightly higher and tilt it. Snuggle into him a bit. And with your flowers, just have them by your side. Wow. You've been in the game quite a long time. Um, and obviously one of the questions everybody would, would want to know is, we'd all be interested in hearing is, how did you get into photography in the first place? I got into photography through really being keen, a keen amateur um, as a kid and I got a job, mortgage like everybody else, and I ended up going to Dublin Camera Club, actually, and rekindled my passion for photography, met a wedding photographer there, and decided to ask could I go out with him on a wedding, and I was hooked. I think I was extremely lucky, to be honest, that when I got into the business, the photography business was changing. I used to go into people's houses, these brides' houses, and they'd see photographs of their parents where they're standing at the car just to black and white, but it's a kind of very casual shot. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, that's what I want. Or just in the church doorway, just not contrived. So, I, you know, photography had gone so far down one path, but it was starting to turn around again and started to go, okay, let's go for this more naturalistic style, not overposing. That was coming in as I was coming in, and I just grew as that grew. Obviously, over the years, your, your gear would have changed. And, yeah. Like, I'm not going to deny it. I'm a bit of a gearhead. I like to okay. look at what other people are using. Yes. So what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you find in your bag on any given day? I use all Canon gear. When digital happened, Canon were the first to say, right, we're going to do this right. And they were the very first people to bring out a full frame camera, which was the 1DS. Yeah. And I bought that and it didn't have any buffer issues. So that's when you shoot lots of, lots of frames and then the, the computer in the camera goes, stop, we want to process this. So there was no delaying when I was shooting. It was like shooting on film. That was fantastic. So I bought all Canon gear. I bought prime lenses. I bought 24 to 70, the 70 to 200, the classic run and gun lenses for, for Canon yeah. gear. I'd have primes, 24s, 50s, 85s, 135, 135 F2 lens. Gorgeous lens. Absolutely. You, you cut yourself Abs looking at it. Absolutely yeah. amazing. I went for the top end, the, 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 the most expensive, the best Canon camera they produced. I wanted it. Because if I'm putting myself in that environment where you, know, you have to get the shots, you have to nail the, nail the shoot, and there's no coming back tomorrow to do it, you want the best gear. I feel really confident when I go out with the Canon gear that it's water sealed, it's bulletproof, it never lets me down, and that gives you confidence. Have you seen, as a wedding photographer over the years, have you seen a lot of change? Have you seen the challenges change? And you'd hear a lot of people talking about, oh, how brides have changed. And mm. I, I think in every industry, you yeah. know, your, your relationship with clients and yeah. client types and clients needs always yeah. change. So how, what have you seen and how do you keep up with it? You really have to be open to change. As a photographer, I constantly challenge myself to change and move and come up with new ideas, see what's currently trending. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I follow the crowd because I don't, but 
I do like to fine tune the type of photography I do and come up with newer ideas, whether that's technical ideas like slower shutter speeds to capture motion, to capture blur. Yeah. It's evolving all the time and you just see it on the likes of Instagram, Facebook. It's a brilliant time to be in the business. And are there any specific techniques that you've developed or that you use that you found give your work a lot more of that impact? Mm -hmm. For me, it was always about keeping it simple. If you keep it simple, you don't get yourself caught up, tied up in knots. So that's the first thing. But that's probably been a bit disingenuous because I work hard at getting the image that I want. I predict, I obviously I have experience of 20 years in the business and you know, it could be very easy for me to go, oh, listen, I know what's gonna happen here, but you know, you have to be aware and be on your toes at all times. And that's when you get those magic little shots and that's what makes the difference so working hard at a wedding no shortcuts being alert for the entire day and then planning the shots that you're going to shoot with the couple say you're going to bring them to the docks in Cork you're going to you know bring them to the mountains plan the shots plan your time time management I haven't touched on that that's huge yeah. in wedding photography my clients want beautiful shots but they want to spend five minutes doing them of course so it's a trade-off between that. I shoot both ends of the lens in the sense that if you have a, a zoom lens, so you have a wide angle 24mm, a, a, a more telephoto end at the 70mm. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm looking at a shot, if I feel it needs this kind of wide vista, I'll shoot at a 24 end. If I see a little moment between two people as kind of more of a private moment or a little intimate moment, I can then go straight to the 70 end and capture that. And you're using the equipment to help you work the shot? Correct. The yeah. equipment is everything then I might take my prime lens out and I might move around. And with a 50 millimeter prime lens is just the most amazing lens, versatile lens. You could actually shoot a whole wedding on a 50 millimeter yeah. lens and you can get beautiful wide shots and you can get quite nice tight shots as well. You just have to be a little bit careful with your framing, but it is a absolutely beautiful lens. I bought the latest 24 to 70 and it's breathtaking, particularly on the 1DX, it's breathtaking. Yeah. <coughs> so, I've kind of regressed a little bit, if, you, if I want a better word, to, to back to that and enjoying that flexibility I have with that lens okay. on that camera's amazing. So I have it everywhere, you know, I can't, I can't complain. The gear helps me produce the stuff Absolutely. that I want. Well, Mark, that's fantastic. Thanks a million for coming in to talk to us today. We really appreciate the time. Pleasure, Michael. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Good to see you again. I caught up with Dave Norton, one of the best landscape photographers in the world. So I'm here at Glendalough with the guys and girls from Canon Ireland to run a day for Canon's CPS members here in Ireland. And we've been doing a series of little two hour workshops in the beautiful area around us, just talking about how I approach my landscape photography and how I look at a scene and determine where I need to be and when. Generally speaking, the best landscape photography is done when the sun is low in the sky or just after it's set or, or about to rise. So by definition, most landscape photography takes place at the beginning or the end of the day. But all rules are made to be broken and there are instances when the light in the middle of the day can be advantageous. And there are, but essentially it's all down to the angle of the light and that of course varies massively with the with the seasons as well what you want most as a landscape photographer is change because changeable conditions usually bring the most drama so settled hot hazy conditions are lousy rain sort of fronts moving through bringing a lot of change and clarity and that drama in the sky is is really the best it's very rare that i'll get the picture i want from a first visit it will often take repeated visits. But if an idea is good enough, if a location is strong enough, then it's really worth working it until I get the best possible picture I can. Landscape photography is all about the planning. It's all about preparation. It's all about planning about where you're going to be and when. That's not to say you don't take advantage of spontaneous opportunities, but really you being in the right place at the right time doesn't happen by accident. You do need the right equipment. The most important piece of equipment is, of course, your own eyes, how you see, how you understand light. But I would say in, I've been a professional 32 years now and the whole world of photography has changed 
since then. And evolutions and developments in the world of photography enables us to do things now and photograph in lighting conditions that, that we could never have imagined doing so just 10 years ago. My two DSLRs that I'm working with at the moment are the Canon 5DSR and the 5D Mark IV. Those are my two go-to camera bodies. Uh, and I've got lenses ranging from 14 mil right up to 400 mil. So I, I use the complete range of the system, really. The flexibility of the system is really, really important to me. Aperture priority exposure metering helps me to work quicker. Whether you're using manual meter metering mode or AV, you're still reliant on the camera's metering system. And there is such a good metering system. And just using exposure compensation in tandem with aperture priority, you can just be so quick and responsive, far quicker in changeable lighting situations than you can be using manual metering mode. Filters I use to solve a problem. Uh, filters I use essentially as contrast control devices or to slow down exposures. You only use a filter if you have to, and if I can get away without doing so, I will do. And these days, I'm using less and less filtration, but they're still important. So all pictures will pass through post-production. They'll all, I'll pay attention to the black and the white points, the contrast range, I'll selectively lighten and darken areas of the image if I need to. But essentially what I'm doing is just tinkering with what's there in the first place. And for me, the picture should all be about the subject. Uh, and if the picture becomes about the post-production techniques, then I've failed. There's nothing worse than an overcooked image. Uh, I think all images should have that umbilical cord connection with reality. Five and a half years ago, we started up this F11 membership, whereby our F11 members subscribe to receive our monthly online magazine. Uh, and it seems like just yesterday, but uh, what our F11 members receive in return for their uh, patronage is monthly tutorials, articles by me, features from behind the lens, and also talented other professional photographers with their input from different sectors of the profession. So it's a real resource that just keeps growing and growing and growing. Over to Greg Manahan, who interviewed the renowned director of photography, Stephen O'Reilly, on the best way to make high quality film on a budget. Steve, thanks for your time. Hi. Thank you. So Stephen, we know that you have huge experience in television in Ireland, both in making commercials and also shooting factual TV on national television. But you also have cinema experience and probably the most notable recent project that you worked on was the feature, The Summit. We're on our way in. That is Trango Tower there. How hard can it be? <laughs> there is a struggle in every breath. You've done entire broadcast TV uh, series, one of the best known uh, kind of outdoor factual shows on Irish television yeah. is Tracks and Trails, and you shot that on a C100. Yes, um, I mean, I, I shot, I think it's 35 episodes now, so over the last six years. So um, for in the last couple of years, we had a C100, that was my own camera. And um, the reason I, it's not that I couldn't get my hands on a C300, I, I could have done, but I actually preferred the ergonomics of the C100. Um, because one of, the, uh, one of the things I love about DSLR, shooting with DSLR, is, is, is being able to g travel light. I don't, I don't like adding loads of bits to my cameras. I want them to be small. Most of that series is shot on a tripod. In fact, I think it's nearly all shot on a tripod. The intimacy of bringing a camera up here and being able to shoot, putting your eye into it, now, with a 5D, I would have used a Zacuto, like a little uh, loop to, to pull it into your eye, which helps you be more stable. You can really get involved in the, in the picture. I, I love that type of style of shooting. My favorite lenses for that, that kit and that setup were um, I'd have to have something super wide for big landscapes um, and then long lens stuff because our presenters are often walking over a ridge of a, a mountain or a hill and we may be 500 meters away. At the long end, I had a 7200. 
uh, which I used a lot, and even a lot of the interviews that we did on it, I'd be further away, sort of nearly observing from a distance on that long lens look, kind of compressed look. But that particular lens, my favorite, was actually the F4 one, the non-stabilized one, which a lot of people maybe would overlook for, 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 for a video, but I am a big fan of it. And the reason is, at that focal length, you're probably not shooting handheld. So even though these, the, the uh, higher models in that range, the, um, the F2.8s with the stabilizers, they're much more expensive, they're heavier. But when you're shooting on a tripod, you, you don't need stabilization. So I preferred the, um, the lighter uh, 70 to 200, and it's F4, which you might think, well, it's not that fast, but because the cameras have such a good low light capability, you could just crank up your ISO and not worry too much. And at that focal length, F4, things are looking, you know, you've got a, a soft background anyway. So then my standard go-to lens with that kit would be, um, was a 2470, uh, and I had a Mark II. Um, it's a sharper lens, and it's just a superb all-rounder. Um, and then the, at the wide end, I actually, a lens I preferred was this EFS lens. It was a 10 to 18. So it's actually plastic, right? And I, at first I thought, oh, this, this can't be great. But uh, having done some testing with it and did a little bit of research online as well um, through Ken Rockwell, that kind of lens guru guy, um, discovered it's actually very, very sharp. And um, so for what I needed it for, which was just sort of either in tight spaces, just to give you that very wide angle, or to show an epic sort of uh, scene like a mountain valley, with two little dots of people walking through it. It was perfect. As a professional, we normally would not go near autofocus for video. You mm -hmm. manually focus all the time because you couldn't really trust it. Um, and it'll do sort of funny things. But um, I have to say, of all the autofocus systems, the Canon is far and away the best, where you could lock onto a face and you can actually track and it will, it will actually hold that focus. It's the first time I started using autofocus, uh, and that was in uh, the Tracks and Trails series. So. The, the incredible thing about it is, like, the lenses we're talking about here are relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Like, that wide-angle lens is, is under 300 euro, yeah. if, I, if, if I'm right. That's right. You know, there's a lot of, uh, often there's a lot of um, kind of gear snobbery, um, but I think if you find, uh, if you test a lot of the, the, some of the cheaper gear, it, you can get really, really good quality stuff. And another good example of that is, I would always say to, well, I would always say to anyone starting out, if they say, well, what lenses should I buy? I would say, okay, have a walk around lens, a standard zoom, that's fine. But the first lens I would tell people to go and buy is a 50 mil prime. Canon have a variety of them. It makes you make creative decisions rather than relying on your zoom. So instead of, being in a position saying, well, I, I now I've got that shot of that person there. Now I want to get in and get a different angle or, or, or you know, rather than just going in on the zoom and cropping, it forces you to move around and, and get creative. And you can, you know, it's, it's, it's a brilliant lens to, to start getting creative with, you know, the 50 mil prime. But again, that's another example of an inexpensive lens. If I'm a filmmaker, a budding filmmaker, whether I'm looking at getting into the business or I just like to story, you know, tell stories, with the, with the camera and I want to get out there. I've borrowed, you know, maybe up to five 5,000 euro to get out and yeah. to get myself started. Um, what would be your best direction? And, you know, as I said, we're very refreshed that you're kind of not a big fan of huge rigs and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Let's get the basics right. A good camera body, a good set of lenses. Yeah. What are we talking about? Lenses, uh you are an investment for the future because what tends to happen is camera bodies will change over time, but uh, a couple of reasonable lenses to start with will carry forward in, in, with your kit. The ADD is a great place to start. Um, it has a lot of the functionality and the quality of the higher end cameras at a, at a budget price. There's a kit lens you can get, which is a great starting point because it gives you the full focal range that you may need uh, from wide angle to right through to sort of telephoto, semi-telephoto. It's also got um, stabilization in it, which is great because one of the downsides to shooting handheld with a small DSLR without a rig, which I prefer, is that you can get, no matter how, uh, how stable or professional you are, you get, if you've had a couple of cappuccinos, you know, you can get little bits of jitter and stuff like this. And so the stabilization just irons out those little creases in your, in your, in your uh, hand movements on the camera. Um, again, it has the autofocus tracking, the dual pixel, 
So it's, um, it's a really superb starting point. So the lenses for that I would choose would be, I'd, if, if you need something wide, I'd highly recommend that lens, the um, 10 to 18 EFS lens. Personally, like that, F4 70 to 200, it's a gorgeous lens. And, and it's an L range. It's a lens you'll carry forward with you as your kit evolves or as your skills evolve, because it's so robust and, uh, uh, and relatively good value. So Stephen O'Reilly, thank you so much for your time and your generosity in imparting your life in uh, cinematography as it pertains to particularly DSLR and of course our Canon products. Thank you very much, Absolute Stephen. Absolute pleasure, Greg. And here's Michael O'Sullivan, who will be comparing the Canon 5D Mark IV and the Canon 5D SOR. I get asked all the time what I think the major differences are between these cameras. The 5DS or 5DSR and the 5D Mark IV. The 5DSR and 5DS models, really their big impact and their big contribution into you know, what they can give to photographers is that high resolution. If you need very large prints, very smooth tonal gradations, then this is the camera you need to be looking at. The difference between the 5DS and the 5DSR is that the 5DS still has the traditional anti-alias filter enabled, but the 5DSR has got that filter still in place, but it is counteracted additionally within camera to give you crisper, sharper images than you would have with the anti-alias filter enabled. The 5D Mark IV does have the anti-alias filter, and it being lower resolution as well makes a difference in terms of how much cropping you can do or what size, but it's still a high-res camera. It's a 30 megapixel camera. It's plenty for almost all situations. The big advantage of this camera is the fact that the autofocus on this camera, in my opinion, is second to none. I'll give you a quick example. About a year, a year and a half ago, I was shooting an event in a castle in County Galway, and it was really, really dark. And I was shooting live view, being able to touch focus and shoot immediately in near dark while using live view was a phenomenal feature. This camera autofocus can function down to minus three EV, whereas this one can focus down to minus two EV. So there's about a stop of a difference as to how dark you can be and still get really good autofocus. The 5DS and 5DSR can shoot up to five frames per second, and the 5D Mark IV can shoot up to seven frames per second. It's quite a difference. If you think about it, it's about 40% increase in frame rate. So if you are shooting uh, fast moving objects, or a good example is birds in flight, the more frames you can add to birds in flight, the more different wing positions you're gonna get. One of the features I really like in the 5D Mark IV is the Wi-Fi and the ability to be able to use the Canon Camera Connect app and, and control your camera from the phone or transfer images back and forward, or also to be able to even upload images immediately via the web services to your social media. That is invaluable and massively helps to speed up your workflow. It also has GPS so that for organizing your images and again, which really helps with the, the workflow, you know, being able to tag your images with geolocation is invaluable. Something that I don't use as much, but I've played around with it and used it a little bit, but because I'm using both cameras in tandem, the 5D SR doesn't have touchscreen. It also doesn't have Wi-Fi or GPS, but it doesn't have the touchscreen. The 5D Mark IV has a really cool touchscreen feature. These cameras deliver for the vast majority of, you know, what I need from a stills photographer point of view on a day-to-day -day basis. But I would need to do some video especially for corporate or commercial commissions a few times a year, sometimes PR stuff, I need to deliver some video as part of the remit. The 5D Mark IV has better video functionality, right up to 4K. Who are these cameras for? Each one brings its own new strength that allows me to actually push that little bit further and do a little more. So each one will cover, like I said, practically everything I need to do, but they bring that extra little bit. So the 5D SR brings the extra resolution for when I need it, and the 5D Mark IV you know, for low light autofocus in practically nearly in the dark, there's nothing can touch it. Back over to Greg, who's introducing us to the new Canon EOS C200. The question that I get asked a lot now is in the last six months or so, we've seen the introduction of the Canon C200. Where does this fit in this family? People would have thought, well, logically, it would be something between the C100 and the C300. 
And, you know, one would have to ask, why would you want to do that? The C100 is a very, very good camera for shooting small corporates, web type videos, ideal for the wedding videographer or somebody making short documentaries. Then the C300 was very much targeted at the broadcast market. So where does this camera fit in? This is a camera that can shoot all of those digital uh, low memory usage type videos, but then all of a sudden it can shoot cinema. It shoots in a special format called Canon RAW Light. Canon RAW Light has a very specific workflow, but more and more the NLE market has adopted this as being a standard type of format to use for cinematography. We now have Final Cut 10.4, which has a whole plethora of new features, one of which is the ability to ingest the RAW files directly from this camera. And it also allows you to add various different LUTs uh, at that stage so you can actually see what you're working with. You can still shoot in the 8-bit 420 format in high def uh, and indeed in 4K on this camera. And that's recorded on two SD slots on the back of the camera. If you're shooting in RAW, then on the side of the camera, there's a slot here for a CFAS2 car to be loaded. So that allows you to record two different formats simultaneously. It is quite impressive the images that you get from the MP4 files from this camera at 8-bit 420. And um, I'm not just saying that. I was actually very, very taken when I saw them coming out of the camera. Even in log, I was still able to do a certain amount of grading, no breakup of the color uh, out of this camera because of the sensor and the Canon EOS technology is quite sensational. Very, very impressive, I have to say. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the actual uh, form of this camera. So as you can see here, there are two XLR inputs beside each other here on the top left-hand side of the camera. So you can get a full balanced input into the camera even if the camera is stripped down. So if you want to use this on a gimbal uh, or mounted on a drone or whatever, you can actually strip it down and you can still have audio inputs into here. Even if you don't want to um, use the XLR inputs, there is also the ability to put in a small mini jack so you can put a small uh, DSLR type rifle mic onto the camera. The gain pots and the switches from uh, auto to manual uh, are actually on the back of the camera here. The LCD panel is much more versatile. It's, it's on a two-way axis. So the highlights of this camera are, it has a Super 35 CMOS sensor, dual pixel CMOS autofocus, dual digi DV6 processor. It shoots 4K DCI and 4K UHD, as well as 1920 by 1080. And it shoots in Canon Cinema Raw Light. Cinema Raw Light on 4K, it shoots up to 60 or 50p in 10-bit and 30, 25 and 24p in 12-bit. In slow motion recording, it supports up to 120 frames per second in HD. And of course, Canon being pioneers in log gammas, it shoots C-Log3, giving you 13 stops of dynamic range. So there's only one thing to do now, and that's to bring this camera out and shoot with it. When we think of Canon, we think of beauty. And where better or more beautiful to demonstrate the Canon EOS C200 than this beautiful estate? This is Powers Court Estate, voted number three in the world by National Geographic as the most beautiful estate in gardens. So let's have a look at the, one of the big features of this camera, which is the dual pixel autofocus. You can see in the picture that we're filming, in the foreground, I have a small holly bush on the right-hand side there, and that is currently in focus. If I want to then rack focus to the background for the gazebo in the back there, all I have to do is hit the touch screen in the center there. You'll see a square appearing. Everything inside that square now is going to pull focus. So that's pulled right out to the background there. And of course, my holly bush is now foreground bokeh. And I can reverse that procedure again by just tapping the screen again onto the holly bush, and that immediately comes back into focus. 
The great thing about the autofocus system on this camera is that you can actually change the speed at which the focus racks. So you can do, if you're doing something very quick run and gun type stuff where you need to have very, very quick focusing, you can set it for that, or you can make it more cinematic and slow down the racking of the autofocus. So let's have a look at the face detection on this. So I deliberately have Barney with his back to me here because as soon as he turns around, the camera's gonna rack focus on his face. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to pre-select the rocks in the foreground here. And as you can see, the camera's pulling focus on that now. And where Barney is, is now slightly out of focus. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask Barney to turn around and the camera should recognize his face. So Barney, turn around, please. And as you can see there, a little square appearing in front of his face. So if you walk towards the camera now, Barney, and what you'll see is that the camera will keep his face in focus right the way up to the camera here and everything else is out on bokeh. So the face detection element of the dual pixel autofocus on the Canon EOS C200 is particularly unique to a cinema camera that shoots in RAW. It's very, very useful if you're in a limited budget, limited time, it's one and one run and gun. You have a talking head that you wanna to walk towards the camera. You need to get the shot quickly you're guaranteed that that person's gonna be in focus. You'll get the shot probably in one take, and that's it, you're on to your next setup. Very, very simple, very quick, and ultimately will save yourself a lot of money. Okay, so this part of the estate is Powers Court Waterfall. It's the tallest waterfall in Ireland, 397 feet from top to bottom. At the moment, we're shooting at the MP4 420 8-bit uh, standard speed and uh, have a look at that picture. It's really, really nice straight out of the box, even in C-Log. You can do a certain amount of grading with it. It's not going to break up. We're now going to change from the standard 25 frames a second to 100 frames per second now to show a comparison between the MP4 files. To demonstrate high frame rate cinematography, you can't beat something like this, a very large waterfall with a constant movement of water. So I've been in the television industry for the last 25 years, working about advertising, documentaries, news and current affairs. I've used all sorts of different equipment, cameras, lenses, etc. I have to say, I'm gonna be gutted to hand this camera back to Canon Ireland. This is one of the most beautiful cameras I've ever worked with. The sensor in it is giving beautiful pictures straight out of the box. Having a Canon sensor working in RAW for less than 10,000 euro is something that's really, really special. I wasn't a fan of autofocus until I came across this camera as well. It really is something that is gonna make life an awful lot easier in certain scenarios for me. I can tell you now that when it comes to shooting short films and ads, I'll be seriously considering this as my A camera going forward. I'm really sad to hand this back. Let's catch up now with Nick and Greg who interviewed Mike and Bob Kahn from Kahn's Cameras in Dublin. Well, we're absolutely delighted today to meet one of our main sponsors and probably the greatest stockist of Canon product on the island of Ireland, Mike Kahn. You've been in business now, second generation. This is a big year for you that we're coming into now. Yeah, uh, well, we're, we're actually 50 years in business this year. And we actually have a third generation involved. Um, I have a daughter who's in photography college in IADT in Dunleary. And she's doing pure photography there. And she works for us as, as one of the uh, printers in our lab. And she must come in for special mention as well, in that she's taken to it like a duck to water. So she is very, very good at that. Um, and I also have a nephew involved in the business as well. Um, so we are on actually a third generation. And we are serving third and fourth generations of the same family within the city, which, is, which is amazing, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, you're entrusted by, uh, it's like family members handing down a baton to their children. They bring them in, introduce them. And we find ourselves working with them and we're now finding, well, at my age, I'm now finding that I'm now starting to deal with their children. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of families meet families, and yeah. uh, that's the way it's working. Have you got anything planned for the anniversary this year? Well, we haven't uh, had time to think, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It's early days. September is the actual uh, official um, mark of the, the, the 50th uh, anniversary. 
my father, we are blessed that my father is still around with us. Um, he's a relatively young man of 81. And um, so he's with us. He's, he's the founding member. He's the guy who set it all up. When I walk into your store, it's just, you know, I see such a great range of like used Canon, brand new Canon. I mean, what is it about Canon really that, that stands out for you as, as such a top seller, as such a big draw? Well, I suppose Canon uh, would be the market leader. Simple as that. They're the biggest company in respect of the areas of the photographic market that they cover. Between cameras, top-end lenses, uh, printers, scanners, even to, down to binoculars, mm -hmm. and they're all there. So they have their finger in every single pie, and they are at the top of every single one of those divisions uh, in their product range. The products are brilliantly built. They are very functional. The ergonomics of them, um, I've got to say, most people find the easy lightning dial that they came up with, that's mm -hmm. the icons on top, of the camera, uh, an absolute godsend. They now have the Q menu on the back of the cameras, which make them very easy to get, get into. Both professionals and amateurs alike find them very intuitive. The latest range of cameras involve the touchscreen technology, so what people are used to on mobile phones is now in the cameras. Sure. They have their Wi-Fi connectivity, so you can connect them to social media. And unlike people who are sending off social media images off their phones now, you have it coming off very good cameras and instantly sent off through the Canon app. Mike, thanks a million. And you also mentioned the fact that Bob, your brother, isn't here with us in the studio. However, we did meet you a short while ago back over in the shop to discuss the new Canon 6D Mark II. So let's have a look at that. In this video, we're gonna discuss the new Canon EOS 6D Mark II. I noticed, Bob, the first thing about it is the articulating screen. Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, they've put in the articulating screen, which is, which is also a touch screen, so great for uh, photography at awkward angles. If you're trying to take a shot low down, trying to take it high up, you can, you can touch for your focus point and you can actuate the shutter from just touching the screen. Uh, also then for video users, uh, you, you can pull focus by touching, say, for a, on a face or a touch on the background. Okay, so excellent. The, another big feature is they've improved the uh, pixel count on the camera, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, up to, from 20 million pixel up to 26 million pixel. Uh, Increase, they've, yeah. yeah, they've also put in the new Digic 7 image processor, so better uh, high ISO performance. And on that higher ISO performance, that's good for both the stills and the video end. Yeah. Um, but haven't they improved the actual frame rate on the camera? Yeah, you're, 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 you're gone from four and a half frames a second up to six and a half frames a second. Um, also, I've got to say, with the, the, the other improvement with this camera is the autofocus system is a vast improvement. Yeah, now this, this is exciting. It is, yeah. because you, you've, you've gone from a 11 points of autofocus points, you've gone up to 45 cross point autofocus system, so radically better. Great for wildlife photographers, sports photographers. You know, the original 60 was a savage camera. This camera is now a, a more of an all-rounder. Excellent. And uh, what I like about it as well is the improvement in the actual video functionality. Tell yeah. us a bit more about yeah, that. On the, on the video, uh, they've got, it, it's full HD, but you're up to 60 frames per second. And you've also got the MP4 codec. Um, an, an amazing feature, and this blew me away was the new five axis digital image stabilizer. So much smoother shots, moving shots on it. Absolutely brilliant, but what I liked about it was when we actually combined it with the stabilizer on yeah. the new lenses as well. Yeah. It was absolutely, it went from being brilliant to being absolutely Yeah, fantastic. it even got rid of my shake. <laughs> and, and that'd be hard. The other, the other thing which is great about it is the new 4K time-lapse movie mode as well. So it has a built-in inter intervalometer into the menu system. And that uh, timing system can also be used to time uh, bulb shots in the bulb mode. So no more guessing on your long exposure no shots. More, no more alarms here. Oh, okay. If you'd like to get your hands on the camera, why don't you drop into the shop and talk to one of the team. We hope you enjoy the show and please do join us the next time.